our biggest coaching session. Brian Muffini has somebody that works uh, at what I'm thinking of you called Joe Nigo. This is a gentleman on the right. And this is a, I is probably a little bit dated. Who's seen this video before? I've taken one of my presentations. Yeah, so Joe Nigo, he is from Chicago. He is interviewing random people on the street in the Chicago. And we're going to start with this video quickly. One is Hey, everybody. Joe Nigo here, hitting the streets of Chicago. <laughs> talking with people, talking with the marketplace, getting people's perceptions of and their experiences with real estate agents. What's your opinion of real estate agents? I think uh, there are too many of them. It's kind of like politicians. <laughs> you hate them all but yours. I wouldn't say they're dishonest, but I think you have to be careful. They're shady. They're necessary evil. Like they're after the quick sale. Yeah, I mean, they're okay. They don't follow up. Whatever they tell you at closing ain't gonna happen the next time. They wanna sell stuff, they wanna make money. Mainly they're really good, they're helpful. Some of them are okay, I think. Well, my husband's a real estate agent, so um, <laughs> I'd say fairly positive. I she was married to him. You were married, yeah. not anymore? No. You must have been a bad agent. Yeah. <laughs> What's your opinion of real estate agents? <laughs> Varied. Positive. They've yeah. helped me. They have their own self-interest at heart. They're, they're next to lawyers and a lot of them in our books. Real estate people in general, um, neutral. They have a job to do. They have a knowledge that I don't generally have information available to me and I use them as a resource. If you were to look for a real estate agent today, how would you go about finding that person? I would ask friends. I, I want that personal assurance yeah. that this person is reputable and that they've that they've had a good experience. It's mostly referrals. I've uh, got mine now from a referral. How did you find your real estate agent? It was actually referred from a friend of mine. A uh, recommendation from people I know. I knew of her history and I know other people that have bought from her or with her. We met her through a referral to us. Maybe start with referrals, but then I'd, I'd talk to a couple. Is this live? <laughs> no, no, it's not like <laughs> the Oprah this? show or anything. I don't know. Who do you have today? Oprah. You get Oprah in England? Yeah, all right. It's not Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to give a real estate agent advice on how to build their business and take care of a client and get referrals, what advice would you give them? Oh, I. Uh... Just be personal. Really be more of a people person and not a pushy salesperson. To be a good listener and try to understand what the client wants and then help them fulfill their needs. The good ones will call you back and see if you're happy, if you you know, if you need anything, if if you were just happy with their services. Follow the golden rule, treat others as you'd want to be treated and be honest and ethical and upfront. Uh, be truthful with the uh, uh, client and uh, that's the main thing. Develop a personal as well as professional relationship because again in this business referrals and and having a good professional aura keeps you in business it works well with people. I think that we all have desires and needs a little bit deeper than money so to focus on that I think would be something interesting. At least it would make me feel a lot better with my real estate agent. We've got a really great, great real estate agent now that's helping us with maintenance and things like that. He's like, I know the area and, and he's he's very proactive and he, and he does stuff like, I'm going to do this at my house. Do you want me to just get an estimate for your new house too? I had a great experience with my real estate agent. It's like a friend now. He's worked with all three of my friends now and yeah, he pretty much is, you know, obviously I found him and then we became friends and because of his relationship with me and how I had a good experience with him, now he gets more business. If I have any questions about the house or, you know, that I'll just shoot him an email and he emails me right back and everything. You know, Christmas cards, uh, calendar every year, you know, that sort of thing. She sent uh, cards at Christmas and uh, I believe uh, we got a birthday card as well, my wife did. You know, she'll call every once in a while just to say hello and ask about what's going on with us and the family and so she's like she developed a personal relationship with us. She could do whatever she wanted, send us calendars or wreaths, candy, bottles of champagne, whatever, things that she's done in the past, but we wouldn't go back to her just because I just don't think that she was um, forthcoming to us in all of the dealings that we had with her. <laughs> Do you, do you own your own home? Yes. How, how long ago did you buy it? Uh, about seven years ago. Do you remember your real estate agent's name? No. Yes. Yes. No, I don't. Wait, yes, I do. No, I don't. Why is that? <laughs> I couldn't tell you. Probably so busy working hard to pay for it now. I just bought another house two years ago. They still ain't come back to Do you me. remember your real estate agent's name? No. 
No, I know the woman. How long ago did you buy that house? 1988. Do you remember your real estate agent's name? Yes. No. No. I don't know what she looks like, but I don't remember her name. I bought it in uh, 1995. Do you remember your real estate agent's name? I have to look. I would have to look it up. If your agent did a great job, would you refer your agent? Yes. Yeah. But you can't remember their name. No. no. Okay, you refer them then. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. The marketplace has spoken. We've discovered how people are looking to find a real estate agent. They're looking for a referral. They're looking through family members and friends. So I have a question for you. Do your clients remember your name? And what are you going to do differently? I love this. So for anybody who's been in a real estate agent for some time, you ever had a really great experience with a client and then five years later, six years later, you've driven by their house and or you've done that terrible search on MLS and noticed that their house is for sale with somebody else or it's sold to somebody else or you find out through the grapevine. Is that, has anybody been in the industry long enough for that to happen? Yes. You've had that experience. How does that make you feel? Terrible. And did you feel prior to that, like you had a positive experience with them? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And did you really follow up find out why perhaps? No, I did not. not. It's, it's, but I'm definitely changing that about my approach and my personality because I was uh, feeling I don't want to bother people. I don't want to be a uh, nagging agent. I don't want to sell myself all the time, blah, blah, blah. So I'm changing that, obviously. Um, so, the, and that's why. So you can do it in a way where it's not that, it's helpful, it's just touching base, it's just saying, I'm still here, you really need all this thing. So before I had that attitude of like, they don't really need or want to hear from me again, assuming that they will remember me because it was such a great experience, but they don't necessarily. So we judge others by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. Is that a true statement for most of us? So most of us would say, no, I, I really had a great relationship with them. I don't want to bother them. I don't want to be salesy. Would that be a fair statement for a lot of people after you close a transaction? I did a great job. They know who I am. They know I sell real estate. I'm sure they'll refer me, but then you choose not to communicate with them again after because you don't want to come off as like the pushy salesperson. Who would say that that's true for themselves and their business? Okay. However like, much caffeine you put in the coffee, Sean, we need to like help it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. So I love this. So you think you're bothering, you think you're bothering them. They think what? That you got their commission checked and forgot about them. And that's the reality of the way that we come across with salespeople. We have salespeople in our industry that don't even thank people for closed transactions. You bought a house with me. That's it. You had a great experience. And then you don't even show up after closing to say thank you can't even write a personal note. Gratitude in express is the same thing as the lack of gratitude. We're going to come back to that again. But I want to take a step back and just talk about working by referral in general. So who likes the idea of working by referral? Lots of people, because it sounds like you don't have to be a pushy agent to do it, right? So in Ontario, you go to school, you get your real estate, uh, you get your real estate license. What part of the course do they talk about how to build a business? What, what, what course is that in? In phase one, two, three, articling, the following up courses. Yeah, Where do they sit with you and be like, okay, here's how to do it. Here's how to write an offer. Here's what you need to know about METs and bounds, whatever that, they still teach that? Is that still a thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah the lot boundaries, it's not that, right? Where do they sit down and talk to you about how to build a business? They don't. They don't. They don't. And so you get your real estate license and you show up at your brokerage on the very first day. What do you think is going to happen? Take you back to your first day in real estate. They're going to give you leads. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> that, like, so no, everybody I know knows I'm a real estate agent now, and they're just, leads are going to come to me. People are going to call me to sell their house. I'm going to post four times on social media, and then the phone is going to ring. I'm going to join Keller Williams, and then Sean's going to walk by my office and be like, here's a listing for you. Here's a buyer. Does that happen in this office or any office in real estate? It does not happen. We are responsible for generating our own leads. Now, I'm curious to know from the group here and from the people online, um, outside of working by referral, what other ways are there to generate leads or build a pillar of your business, build a business in real estate? Give me some examples. How else are you getting clients? So nobody taught you how to do this. You figured out by yourself. How, where are your clients coming from? People that you know directly. People, okay, but how do they find out you're in real estate? Well, you Reaching out. Well, yeah. yeah. Oh, you reaching out to them directly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So maybe some version of working by referral. What else? Other than working by referral, how else would you get your business? Open houses. houses. Open houses. Okay. Don't so you sit in open house and then hopefully people come in and they're not under buyer representation and you chat with them. Yep. Advertising. Advertising. What kind of advertising? Online. 
online, so you're buying online buying. leads, perhaps. Okay, so you're are you there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, buying online leads. Door knocking. Door knocking. Another one. So you're going out, rain, snow, shine, whatever. You're going to go knock on doors. What's another one? Another cold one. Cold calling. Cold calling. Like some cold calling. Who's like, I want to wake up tomorrow and call 400 people. They're going to tell me to f off. Like in many different iterations of that. Nobody's excited about that. Okay. Yeah. So you're open house, online lead purchasing. Um, and farm, 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 farm area. area. And so, what does a farm area look like? Mail, like, yeah, that's that's right. mail yeah. outs. Yeah. Out of curiosity, how much does it cost to mail out something to somebody's house? So, you produce mm -hmm. a whatever poster. Yeah, that that how much? Oh, well, probably a couple hundred. Eight well, cents? Cents? No. Our house doesn't own that. Nope. It's a lot of how I'm much not farming. How much is a stamp when you go to the uh, post office right now? About a dollar? Eighty-seven. Yeah. So, when you generate the mail, yeah. generate a newsletter to six, seven dollars, maybe. Yeah. So, per house. Yeah, maybe five, six dollars, not including your time. And then how many houses in your farm area? Two thousand, ten thousand dollars a month, maybe, to be able to stay top of mind. Who goes home at the end of the night, opens their mailbox them and then just throws them all in the recycling bin? Because I'm in real estate and I don't even care what they have to say. So lots of different ways to generate business. And to be clear, there isn't one right way and there's one wrong way. You know, Diane Mitchell, who is a you know the owner of our brokerage, her she runs a her and her husband ran a team that were like door knocking specialists and they got out there and they knocked on doors and they did it literally she'll tell you the story about the, the frozen snot story yeah. if you haven't heard it from that yet yeah it's a great story um but you've got to get out there so the important thing with any basis on which you're going to build your business has to be understanding your lead conversion and so this is what i want to talk about quickly before we get into working by referral lead conversion um, at the highest level and lead conversion at the lowest level. Does anybody want to tell me what the, of all the things that we just talked about, where the lowest lead conversion is? And what I mean is how many contacts to how many closed transactions? Maybe You're not going to be calls? happy about this. It's Maybe online calls? leads. About one in a thousand <laughs> online leads. Wow. And how would you feel if you paid, anybody do online lead generation? Like what does that cost you? Three to five dollars, depending on some of them cost as much as 40. So online lead generation, cost you thousands of dollars, one in a thousand online leads actually convert to a closed transaction. So maybe you're gonna rethink that one. What's next if we're going down the going down the list of lead cold generation? Calling. Cold, calling. cold calling, yeah. So who likes getting calls from people when about <laughs> duct cleaning or other such services or real estate? So cold calling. Anybody who's a cold caller here? And what's your conversion? How many phone calls to conversations and how many conversations to closed transactions do you know? So I will do about 400 calls. Uh -huh. I will have about uh, close to 100 conversations. Uh -huh. And I will get two to maybe three leads. Okay. That I need to nurture and follow up. So two or three leads out of 400 calls. And how many of those leads until a closed transaction? Um, so I'm a new agent. Unfortunately, yeah. I still don't have, uh, you don't have that number yet. Uh, number. That number yet. Okay. So we'll say 200 maybe to one for to, to a real lead, like somebody who actually wants to have a conversation about real estate. Door knockers, you get out there, you knock doors, you've got, you know, you put on your suit, you walk out, you talk, knock on doors. What's the conversion for door knockers? <clears throat> I do that as well. Oh, no, no I do. Yeah. You're hustling. <laughs> I am trying to figure out, hopefully, which one is the best. Yeah. So I do door knocking, and um, about 100 door I will knock. Yeah. I will, depending on the weather, depending on the uh, day, I will have like a, somewhere between 15. Um, conversations, conversations. Yeah. and then database you're collecting information for database probably yeah I and then mm -hmm. yeah I, I, I like them on my database okay. and then um one one lead came actually you put an offer and uh, there were some other issues but uh, that was my okay numbers so yeah so 100 doors to conversations and we're not even talking about closed transactions yet guys we're talking about just conversations with people does anybody was there another one we talked about open houses who's done an open house and had zero people show up Oh, everybody, because it happens, right? So not a great way to spend your weekends. It's four hours. I, whoever in real estate years ago decided that we should monopolize agents' time for four hours over two days in the middle of the weekend, uh, that person should be shot, I think. Um, but open houses, yeah, it hit and miss, right? Because in a hot market, lots of people are coming through, but many of them are under representation. In a cooler market, less people coming through, less conversations to be had. So a bit challenging. So the conversion numbers in working by referral are a little bit different. 
So who's ever gotten an email or a phone call from a client where you've said, like, you've got to work with Sunita because she is amazing. And they've actually taken the time to like copy their friend on that email and be like, hey, she helped us buy our house. We're super excited about, um, you know, introducing you because I know she's going to do a really great job for you. Has anyone ever gotten an email or a phone call like that? Yes. What's your conversion on that? 90%. 100%. 100%. Like, like there, it's, you have to really work hard to screw it up. They yeah. basically just handed you a client on a silver platter. So when we talk about different ways to build a business in this industry, I focus on working by referral because it has been my experience that when you put the energy and the effort into building the relationships, the business comes to you every day. You wake up and you open your email or you listen to your voicemail, you check your DMs, and there are people who are referring business into you. But how does that happen? Does anybody want to guess? So, yep, you're asking for it, but how do you actually how do you actually turn the people in your sphere of influence into advocates for your business? Anybody want to guess? What an excellent service. So people are like, yeah, absolutely. When I get the listing, when they start becoming a buyer client of mine, absolutely, I'm going to provide excellent service. The problem with that is it's chicken and an egg, right? You don't have the clients yet. How do you provide excellent service? The idea of working by referral is going to be building a database, pouring service into that database before there is business there with the expectation that if you show up in service to people and they see that you are a great agent, you know what you're doing and you care about them, that they will in turn turn over their referrals to you, also their own business. Yes, Sean. Stephen Adlin does a great oh. uh, bit on adding value, validity, variety, and frequency yeah. on a month over month basis so that when people think of real estate, they think of you. You're adding value or you're you know, letting them know the value of their home. Um, validity, so you're saying things that are correct and have meaning. Uh, variety, so it's something different every time. And then frequency. People um, won't work with you until they you've satisfied three things. And I said it in the meeting this morning, and then I like very embarrassed when we forgot the third one because I always do. Not a day, Emily. Do you want to tell me what it was? So the three things that they need to do, you need to do before a person will work with you. So someone in your sphere, one of them is not they know you're in real estate. Guys, we are in the most oversaturated market that exists anywhere in the world for real estate professionals. I say professionals because we all know people that are not professionals. They are people with real estate licenses. One in 76 people in the GTA have a real estate license. The guy that cuts my lawn has a real estate license. Would I call him if I wasn't in real estate? I would not call him because I know him as my grass cutting guy. But I guess some people do because he has a real estate license. What are the three things that he has not proven to me yet, which is why I will not work with him? Do you trust him? Do you, care about do, you, do you care about me? Do you trust me? Are you good and are you good at what you do? And if you haven't proven those three things to your clients, they won't work with you and they won't refer to you. And so what we're going to talk about today is building a database and how you communicate your value to meet those three things as you um, move forward towards trying to receive referrals. Any questions so far? No? Okay. <laughs> Am I pressing the right button? Here we go. I love this, and this is actually a quote from um, Barb Best, I think. Um, she went to family reunion a few years ago, and I thought this was really important. The cost of advertising is the price you pay for having poor or unremarkable customer service. This is important, guys. We have huge agents here in the GTA. Who's heard of Frank Leo? Yeah. Frank Leo, super nice guy, has been in real estate forever, much longer even than I have. Um, but Frank Leo goes out and buys his business every single year. How does he buy his business? The advertising. So the ad buy for you know Frank Leo's uh, Frank Leo's team is probably in the millions of dollars, five, six, seven million dollars. When you look at the online stuff, the print advertising he's still doing, he goes out and he buys his business every single year. If you are an online lead person, you have to go out and you have to buy the leads to try and convert. So the idea is is that if you provide good customer service to your people, the cost is is realized in a very different way. You're not paying on the, it is cheaper. Some may see, some may say that providing um, providing good services actually costs how much? It's free. For mo the most part, almost everything that we're gonna talk about today doesn't cost anything except your time and energy and willing to willingness to try it. But I love this because this is just a reminder, guys. If you're going to rely on something that involves like geographic farming and you're gonna start pouring tens of thousands of dollars into a farm area, just be aware of the fact that you're gonna have to do it over and over and over again. 
So working by referral, this is the fundamentals of it. So this is a wheel, and it's a wheel because it's cyclical. We're going to talk about this. So the first thing that you're going to do is add people to your database. Uh, they're going to come from your sphere of influence. You're going to, uh, we're going to talk about a couple of other places that they're going to come from today. You're then going to try to build relationships with them. You are going to give excellent service. You are then going to ask for referrals. You will then hopefully receive referrals. You are going to acknowledge and reward the refer, and then you are going to turn your lead into an advocate. So this is really important, and I want to focus on this. Where does the transaction come in this wheel? Somewhere between, anyone want to guess? Yes, two, two and three? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Three and four, I would say. So you have to remember the building of the database, the creation of the database, the building of relationships, the giving excellent service comes before the transaction. And this is where so many people get lost. They're like, okay, I'll go find some clients and then I'll start giving service and I'll wait until they do a transaction with me. You need to get out in front of it. You need, especially if you're a new agent and you don't have, you know, 150 past clients that you can lean into. It's about showing up in service to the people that you already know. So we're going to talk first about adding to your database. Who here has a database that they can open up on a CRM right now and show me? And what CRMs are people using? Just like anything else. Follow up boss. Follow up boss. Yep. Another one. Carlos is like looking very questionably. Oh, do we have hands? Oh, we've got comments here. I can't. Uh, I can't show you. Can you? Yeah, you can. Oh, where's my where's my just, mouse, sir? If you can just stay and just speak. Um, just call them out. Oh, sorry, I can't see from here. Lori, who has her hands up? Lori, what is um the, what database are you using? He is command. Command, got it. Yeah, and JP Luz. Agent locator. Agent locator. Okay, I don't know that one at all. I use referral maker and refer. I use referral maker, which is the Feeny product, um, and I do it because um, it has excellent convert. It has the map on the back end that tells me where my conversion ratio is at. I don't know if some of those other ones do have that option or not. But um, database creation. So, what is a database? Not. I want to be clear. A database is not the contacts on your phone. The database isn't your address in Outlook. Your address book in in Outlook. What a database is, is a, uh, a place, it's a repository of the place where you keep names, phone numbers, personal information, birthdays, anniversary dates of transactions, email addresses in one central place. And then from there, you use it to figure out what your contact with that particular person or couple is going to look like. Any questions about the database so far? No. Is a database. So, structured set of electronic data about your clients and prospects that you can easily access and use to track your contact activity with them. You should be able to pull up your database, contact in your database, and tell me exactly how many times you've been in touch with that person in the last year. How often should you be in touch with our clients? 36 times. 36 times according to KW. Would it be safe to say that the market has shifted a little bit and now people are having to be in touch with their clients a lot more to keep them steady and calm in this market? Yeah. How many times are we in touch with our database? I keep referring to these four because Sean, Gabrielle, and Matt, Emily, and Sarah from the call are on. How many times? Ten times talk. That's it. Ten times talk? Yeah. You think I'm talking to people ten times? No, it's higher than that. No, no, I kind of want myself. Oh, for you. Okay. Yeah. I think it depends also. Um like if they are have shown an interest in moving in the next 24 months, you'd probably be talking to them more often. But is the and process of working by referral? Am I looking for a transaction or am I looking for the, a referral? Right. The referral. So we're in touch with our database 65 times a year. Every contact 65 times. Now, I want to be clear, that's not me picking up the phone 65 times and being like, hey Mary, how's it going? That's not that, how that works. We're going to talk about very contact with your database to show up in service. But yeah, 65 times, 65 times uh, a year with our database. So you need to know how many times do we need to be contacting somebody before they can even remember what it is we do or what it is we're about. Do you know? So brand awareness in general, in our in in marketing in general, how many times do you need to see the Nike logo before you know that that's Nike? Seven times. Seven times. Fourteen to sixteen times wow. before you even know, like, oh, that's that, right? And so you think about because we're constantly in the media with ads. You're on Facebook, you're on Instagram, and you see paid advertising. How many times do you see the same ad before you actually recognize? I don't know why I get ta targeted for like the film Akash am I saying that right? It's a it's a it's a makeup company. I watched that ad probably fifteen times before I was like, oh yeah, they they sell makeup. And then I mentioned it to somebody, and they're like, yeah, what is that? I think you're makeup. Like it, the reality is, is that you 
you think you've called somebody once and they're like, oh no, no. I know Matt, Matt knows that I'm in real estate, so I don't need to call him again. Matt's thinking about other things. Matt's got lots of other things on his mind. He's not thinking about the fact that I'm in real estate and I'm looking for referrals. So 14 to 16 times. Why is the database important? The database allows you to easily systemize contact with your clients to grow your business by generating referrals and repeat clients. Referrals came first in that statement, guys, because a regular client, so somebody who's looking to buy or sell, they move even in a fast-paced market, five to seven years. Some of my top refers, how often do you think they're referring me in a, time, in a single year? Five to seven times. Ten times? Ten, ten, five, seven, some of my top offers in the, in the top handful of them, ten times a year. So you are not just looking for transactions. You are looking for opportunities to turn your clients into advocates for your business. And you do that by providing good service. Um, without a database, you really see it as a hobby and not a business. This is a big one, guys, because the reality is, is that many people, so we talked about where your business is coming from. Who would say that your business is coming from a mishmash? If I if, would this accurately describe how your business is run? I do open houses sometimes. I mention to people that I'm in real estate and that I like their referrals. I post on social media. Occasionally, I might door knock. If I have an opportunity to get an online lead, I might take advantage of that through like command. Who would say that it's that sort of varied approach that where their business is coming from right now? Because that's a business. <laughs> I, I would agree with you on that, but that is the vast majority, probably 95% of agents in our industry are what we call chaos agents. So they don't really know where their next deal is coming from. We're going to talk about contact and conversion ratios a little bit later. It's just they're kind of all over the place. When you have one streamline, if you know you're a door knocker and you need to knock on 200 doors before you have a conversation or you need to get through 400 phone calls before you have a conversation, then that's an attainable goal. It's something to work towards. When it's like a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and today I'm doing this and today I'm doing that, it's just total chaos and there is no there is no understanding of where your next deal is coming from. It's super important to know. Who goes into my initial database? So any questions so far before I get into the actual database talk? Yes. And sorry, what's your name? My name is Leila. Leila? Yes. Thanks. Uh, so uh, you said 65 times? Yeah. Um, it sounds too much to me. It does, but I'm going to tell you about how, um, how we break down that 65 because it's not 65 phone calls. I have 65 conversations. It's not even 65 conversations. We'll talk about what that looks like, but thank you. Is there a question there or just a general statement? No, like that's like, to? isn't it too much? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah. how many times is that per month? 65 divided by 12. Five times. Thank God we don't have five, 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 <laughs> five times a month. So does that sound overwhelming? Five, five times a month? That's every, yeah, more than once a week. Well, yeah, I think we talk about what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. If it were me, I'd unsubscribe, but I guess. <laughs> but maybe not. But I love it because you said unsubscribe. That would suggest that it's all one form of communication. Right. Yeah. So if I got five, okay, we'll take a step back here. If I send somebody, okay, five times a month. If I call somebody <laughs> five times a month, what does that mean? No. Harasser. A telemarketer. <laughs> Sorry. If I write somebody five notes a month, what does that mean? Stalker. <laughs> <laughs> if I go by their house five times a month, what does that mean? The door-to-door salesperson. If I, if I, what else could we be doing here? If I invite somebody to an event five times a month, what does that make it kind of weird? Like, <laughs> like I'm using your friends. What if I called them once a month? What if I texted them once a month? What if I every two months invited them to an event? What if every four months I mailed them something of value to their house? What if I invited them to a Blue Jays game with the rest of their family? What if I um, invited them to my office to pick up a pumpkin once a year? What if I popped by their house at the holidays to say thanks so much for being an advocate for my business? Which does that does that make me does that make me any of those things? What does that make me? All of those. A good real estate agent. Someone who makes a million dollars a year. So let's talk about who goes into the initial database. So. Let's talk about who goes into our initial database. So if you have past clients, obviously your past clients are going to go into it. But the reality is, is that nobody just hands you a bunch of past clients. You have to build that, those relationships at a time. 
Um, and I'll share this presentation at the end so you don't have to take pictures, but if you want to, by all means. I just so, want to, sorry, yeah, I please. sometimes take a note. I forgot oh, good, okay, paper. Sorry. I I'm not playing or texting messages. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Some informations are too valuable. Please forget I, I When you go to real estate conferences, you see the phones that come out and people taking it means that there's great engagement. So I appreciate it. If no one's taking pictures, obviously what I'm saying is not that remarkable or remarkable. <laughs> um, but let's talk about who goes into your initial database. Friends, family, neighbors, service providers, past co-workers, co-workers of a partner, extended social circle, circles, out-of-town agents you work with, people you regularly talk about real estate. So obviously past clients, super easy, but our best advocates are also the, often the people you have closest to what, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's that lady you see at the grocery store or always asks you like who the, how the market is, right? Maybe it's the parents of the other kids that play on your you know, kid's soccer team, that sort of thing. Basically everybody you talk about real estate. Now, we don't treat them all equally. We'll talk about qualification of your database in a little bit, but at the very beginning, you want to just get everybody in there. So who said they already have databases? Yep. How many people in your database? Approximately. Cool. 300. Okay. How many of those people, if you walk down the street, they would recognize you and you would recognize them? Um, over 100. Over 100. So we know, um, sociologically <laughs> speaking, that the average human is in relationship at any given time with how many people on average? Do you want to guess? 150. 150 people. So on average, 150 people that if you pass them on the street, they would know you, you would know them. Oh, what's that? You got to tell me if there's a question. My eyes are bad and mold. JP, uh, JP, 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 raising your hand. JP, what's your question? Oh, no, sorry. I was just answering. Uh, I have about 400 people in my database. Sorry, I thought you were asking us to. Okay, so 400 people. It's not how big it is. Yeah, so it's not it's how big it is. It's how deep is the relationship with your database. That's the question. So I usually suggest to people you need to start with about 150 because if you don't have 150, um, it's very difficult for to get a clear understanding of where your conversion ratio is. So you start with 150 people. 150 <laughs> people sounds overwhelming to you. Then there's an exercise that you can do. Actually, Sean Gray did it with my team. He came in and it was an old exercise, and maybe you want to share it with the rest of the group as well. But you were like, no, everybody I know is in my database. I did the exercise with Sean and added like another 40 people to my database, which is already over it's almost 1,100 people. Um, and I was like, wow, that's actually really important. So your database is um, your database has to be the foundation on which you're working by referral business is built. Without a database, you just you cannot pass go, you cannot collect your two hundred dollars. You need to have a database in a CRM that you look at every single day and communicate with every single day. So we're in a relationship with about 150 people. An average database, um, once you start hitting that convert of those those numbers of 14 to 16 times contact per those 150 people should return about how many deals a year in referrals. Not in transactions with those people directly, but in referrals. Does anyone have hazard a guess? Seven. 10%. So about 150 people, once you get to that 14 to 17 points of contact, you're going to be somewhere in and around 10, 15 deals a year, probably from referrals directly, yeah. not just transactions from those people. Yeah. What's that? I thought it's 7%. 7%, about 10%. Right? So, and then of course your database grows. So then you add all the people that you did transactions with that year into the, uh, into the database and it grows and it grows and it grows. So super important. So that's where we're going to start. My next point is, I suggested here a minimum of 75 people. This is when I train new agents on this. You need to have at least 75 people. So again, is it challenging to find 75 people? It's actually not when you start thinking about your sphere of influence um, as something that's not just past clients or people that you've met during, you know, during the transaction of real estate. It's about everybody that you know. How much should my database grow annually and how do I create new contacts? So a healthy database should at least include at least one new contact per week. The reality is, is that a database is like uh, is like a um, is like a lake. You have to have constant stream of fresh water growing and going into it because there will be stuff going out of it. When we have no new stuff going in, what is that? That's a pond and it stagnates and nothing grows in an environment like that. So you need to have a fresh stream of people coming through because how do people leave your database? They end up getting poached by another agent occasionally. They just are not referrers. They're not natural referrers. And we'll talk about that. They get a real estate license themselves and start selling real estate, which have, we all know something that that's happened to, um, or they die. So the reality is, is that you there's always going to be people coming out of your database. You need to continue to put new people into your database. 
So how do you add to your database? So if you're already 150 and you're like, okay, I need to add some fresh blood to my database. So you can host an open house. You can friends or do friends and family of lines that you need through the transaction. Who does um, access visits or showings and your buyers bring their parents or their kids or their friends? Who does that? Everybody, correct? When's the last time you sat had a conversation with real estate about the people that they are bringing with them? Is it realistic to believe that if you've got, you know, clients in their 20s or 30s who are buying their first property and their parents show up, because they always do, um, that those people probably already own real estate as well or connect to other people that own real estate? Yeah. Do people like to bring their friends to access visits or housewarming parties after they bought a house? Yes. Who are you having conversations with? You can host an open house. Uh, open houses are great for one thing, one thing only. I don't really have great conversion with open house picking up buyers, but what are open houses great for? Meeting the neighbors who are not planning on buying this house, but they sure want to talk about their plans for real estate. So host an open house for the intent of meeting the buyers. When you see, I don't know if Barb Best is on this call, but when Barb does her red carpet open houses down in her farm area, what is Barb doing that for? Is she going to sell the house because she put a red carpet and serve people like champagne and cheese? And she's doing it to get the neighbors to come in to be like, wow, she does an, ex an exceptional job. Post an open house for the express purpose of not soliciting buyers, but rather building your database. Post an info party, a uh, party or an info session. We do this a lot um, on my uh, my real estate group. We hold six times a year seminars for our clients on things that are somewhat related to real estate, but not ready, not really. So if I hold a first time buyer seminar, who in this room would be interested in attending that? Probably nobody. If I held a seminar with one of the lawyers that we refer often about wills and estates, how to write your own will, who needs a will, what needs to go into your will, who would be interested in attending that? Probably some of you. If I held a, uh, a seminar about um, how you minimize your taxes or taxation minimization strategies with the our, our on-staff accountant, who would be interested in attending that? Everyone probably, right? So look for opportunities to host information sessions where you can not only continue to engage your clients, but they um, can invite friends and other people that they know. So any questions about that? So parties, who goes to parties and then you make a beeline for the one person you already know at the party and then spend the entire time talking to them about real estate? Probably not what we should be doing these questions though, right? When do you delete? When you drive by, I, it used to be when you saw another agent sign on their lawn, but I've actually pivoted on this because the reality is, as anybody who just sat through Tackle Tuesday, is that there's a 71% chance that that agent won't be able to sell the house anyways <laughs> with what's happening in the market right now. So I would actually see wait until the property sells and then you can take them out of your database. When they get a real estate license, when you see their number show up on their, their phone and you cringe, who is a client like this? We're like, oh, yeah. We all have clients like that. These are not people we want to necessarily be in relationship with. So like, is it a true statement that like people tend to attract like people? So people who suck tend to have other terrible friends that they hang out with as well too. Who's had a client and they're just so amazing. They've advocated for you. They've been a pleasure. It has just been a wonderful transaction. And you just wish you could repeat, you know, like rinse and repeat with a client like that over and over and over again. Yes, we all have. That's who we want to market to. That's who we want to have advocate for us because they tend to have other people in their sphere of influence that don't suck. Because remember, it's not about finding 150 people. If we're in a relationship with 150 people and each of those people are in relationship with 150 people, how many people are effectively in our database? What's 150 times 150? 2250. How many? 22,500. So think about that. So your reach becomes over 22,000 people if you do an effective job of communicating with them. But yes, there's a time to delete people and it's when you get their crunchy phone numbers. So let's talk about sorting your database. So um, is it fair to say that there are people in your business, if you're an established agent, that have been bigger or better advocates or lead sources for you? Yeah. yeah. So give me an example of somebody who has been an advocate in your business as an example. Let's see. So I've been in this business for 12 years. Yeah. I have a client who purchased for the first year. Yep. Yeah. Um, so far, he bought three properties. Yep. Yeah. He referred me more than 40 clients, 40, 40, 40 clients yeah. in the, the 12 years. And each client of these clients also referred me clients. So my, my database is very small and I have like 200 people that I market for them differently because of their personality or their influence. And 
they had to go to experience. So, so past clients and people who have referred you. Yeah. Got it. And so would it be a fair statement to say that the type of communication or the frequency of communication would be with different those people, with those different. people versus the you know person that you heard from on a sign call two exactly. years ago who sometimes answers your calls and sometimes you know like who is this? You're probably gonna market to those people differently, right? But I'm here today to know how to convert those thousands. Why are you not? To be so, like the two hundred. <laughs> My airplane picture. Okay, so this is an airplane. Everyone here, I assume, has been on an airplane. Yeah. Yes, fair statement. Um, we've got A plus, which would be the equivalent of like, who flies first class when they go somewhere? My brother recently, who is, works for me, flew to the Emirates and he flew in one of those little pods. I didn't even ask how much that costs because I am never going to spend that much money on a flight. But the A plus experience is probably a little bit different than say business class which is a right so you're getting like a so a plus you get what you get like real flowers in the bathrooms they give you cutlery right when they serve you a meal they i think on some flights they give you pajamas um a maybe you get a slightly better meal you get a little curtain so you don't have to like look at the person you know, next to you. <laughs> that is where i fly i'm a I'm, a, I'm an economy passenger i'm a, i'm like in zone four when they start calling people i'm squished in the back next to the crying baby and who's C? C would be standby, right? So if we look at our database like an airplane, is it fair to say that the person getting an A plus experience is different than the person in standby? Yes, even on the same plane. So if you imagine your business is like a, an airplane that has a limited number of seats, because there is a limit to how many people we can stay in relationship with in a meaningful way. And if you had to, so if you've got an airplane and it seats 300 people, is it fair to say that that person you just described you're boarding them first, you're gonna offer them an in-flight drink, you're gonna make sure they're good. They start to feel a little sick, you're gonna sit with them, you're gonna hold their hand and be like, are you okay, do you want a blanket? Do you want a pillow? Your experience if you're an A-plus passenger, or if you're a first-class passenger, is <coughs> different than being a B passenger, and certainly different than the person who's like, yeah, you know what, if I have space for you on the airplane, you can come. What if my bees drops off, and it doesn't show up for their flight on time, you can get on, but really that's, that's what it is, right? So when we talk about, a plus A's, B's, and C's, we have to look at our database much in the same way. So how do we rank our database? So who is a an A plus? An A plus is multiple transactions or multiple referrals. So multiple, so this is somebody who has been an advocate for your business, who shows that they're loyal to you. That's an A plus, an A plus client. An A client, one transaction, one referral. So think about this as you're sorting your database. A B, who wants to guess what a B is? Somebody who knows you, trusts you, likes you, and probably would use you for a real estate transaction or probably would refer you if they knew how. Now you'll notice the division of the plane. What's the biggest part of the plane is the bees. Because the idea is, is that you're going to take as many bees as possible, convert them to people who have done transactions, and then you're trying to try and convert as many of them into multiple transaction, multiple referrals as possible. So everybody boards as a B. People that go into your database are people that, if you have, this is if you haven't had any real estate transactions before, you board people as a B. The idea is you try, want to try to elevate them to an A and then eventually to an A plus. Who are C players? It's always a pain in the air. People who are open house leads that you don't really know them, they don't really know you. They are people who are um, all off your sign that you've never met face to face. These are people who, if you know, came through the internet, commented on your Facebook posts, whatever. Um, those are C's. We're going to market to them, but we're not going to spend a lot of time and energy in them. They don't know us. There's no loyalty to them. They don't They don't know us. They don't trust us. They don't know if we're good at what we, we do. We don't know anything about them. So they're going to kind of like come along for the ride if there's space on the plane. Any questions about our plane analogy here? No. So we evaluate and rank each relationship. So there we go. A plus, people you've worked with multiple times or have sent you multiple referrals, worked with once or have sent you a referral. People that you would, would probably work with you or refer someone but have not yet. Some of your C's will elevate to A's. Some of your C B's you will put it back into the C category. So over time. So what's the what's the criteria for how long you keep somebody as a B? 36 months. If they have it, they may not be moving within that time, but they sh you, you, that should be enough if your contact with them is consistent enough that you should be able to satisfy their, you know, their desire to see whether or not there's a relationship or they're not. So 36 months, at which point you de-escalate them to a C. So people you marginally know who may or may not work with you or send you a referral. 
these are we didn't even they weren't even on the flight they didn't make it through airport security these are losers you keep them from your database and everybody has these and you hold on to these people for some reason because you think oh no they listed with somebody else once before or they bought with their cousin but if i just show up and try to you know try to do a better job they are going to work with you they're not going to work with you guys focus your energy and attention on the a pluses a's and b's and occasionally see if you have time the D's, if this is some sort of like weird human thing that goes on in our own brains where we try to like prove to our D's that we are somehow worthy of their love and respect and their business. And so we spend a huge amount of time to con trying to convince them that they made a mistake by not working with us. Just cut it and move on, guys. Where do you think most agents spend most of their time and energy working? With C's. C's. Yeah. C's. So yeah. um, if I told you... I want I want you to call somebody in your database that bought a house. They're not they're not moving anytime soon, but they bought a house from you two years ago. Or I want you to call this person that you you know met it that popped into an open house. Who are most of you going to call first? Most of you will call your open house person first, even though your A people have already shown loyalty to you and interest in working with you. And people ignore the people that they have already, agents ignore the people that they have already worked with, and then they lean into the internet lead they got yesterday, or the person that popped into their open house who was like shopping for their cousin's uncle's brother and just wanted to walk through the house. We spend collectively as an industry the vast majority of our time on our C's, which is the wrong place to spend our attention. Almost all, so to give you guys some idea of where my business comes from, 98% come from my A and A plus clients in a year. Oh, do you want to come back in? Any questions about this, guys? Why do we spend time with our C's? We spend time with our C's because we think the B's already know we're in real estate. They'll call if they need anything. The A's, they're good. I already sold them a house. And an A plus, they know me. They're going to send me referrals again. It's fine. But what happens when we don't nurture the relationships? You mentioned already what happens. So you met an A, somebody who had worked with you in the past and had, you know, obviously, you know, decided that you were the right agent for them to represent them in that transaction. You didn't keep in touch with them. And what, what ends up happening with that relationship? Well, they just feel appreciated. Yeah. So when I sit a, at a uh, listing presentation and I look to see, you know, when they bought the house and how long they've been there, ultimately, in almost all cases, they bought that house with somebody else. And it's sometimes a huge agent that I know very well. It's sometimes somebody that I, I don't know at all. Um, I will ask point blank. I will say, why is it that, you know, you're not calling the agent that you had this transaction with? Sometimes in very rare circumstances, they'll be like, oh, man, they bungled it. It was not a good experience. Almost all of the time, guys, do you know what the answer is? 95% of the time, what is the answer that I get about why they're not calling that agent? They forgot about it. I just never heard from them. Like, yeah, it was a great experience. Like, yeah, they were really nice. We just never heard from them again. But you've been in touch. And, you know, you did a great job for my cousin last year. I think you came so highly recommended. So yeah, we're going to go with you. So that's the reality of what happens. Again, we judge others by their actions we judge ourselves by our intentions it was our intention to do a really good job for them it was our intention to like bend over backwards to make sure that they bought something you know that, that was a great fit for them um we just didn't continue to show up in service the average person um who holds a smartphone in their pocket gets inundated with how many ads in a particular day you want to guess this number is staggering to me <laughs> Oh, okay. 22,000. Okay. Think about you pick up your phone and you scroll through your feed. Mm -hmm. First of all, Facebook isn't like Facebook was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. It is almost all paid advertising now. You can say the same thing true uh, as well for um, for uh, Instagram as well or TikTok. It is almost all paid advertising. You are scrolling through and you are inundated with thousands of ads an hour. You sit in your car, you turn on the radio, even Sirius XM, like you're being inundated with ads. You sit down to work at your computer, you work on a website, you're being inundated with ads. 22,000 asks or messages a day. Is it safe to say that if somebody hasn't heard from you in five years, there's a good chance they're not going to call you now, right? You might get lucky, they might. Chances are better than their chances are more likely that they're not. So calculating contact ratios. I asked specifically, yes, you can. Sorry. <laughs> The um, so if you have a situation where you just described like an A or an A yep. plus that for whatever reason you bungled or you yep. just didn't follow up in a while, yeah, how much 
How much effort should you invest into getting them back into your court? When had did have they done something with somebody else? Like they bought or sold something with another agent since then? Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter if they have or not. The answer is. Does anybody want to guess the answer? So you've got somebody who you know. Put up your hands if you guys have somebody you know right now that you need to call. Because they were a great client for you. You haven't called them in a long time. It's a trick question. It's everybody. We all have the, the, the answer is yesterday. The next best time, today. If you can't make it happen today, do it tomorrow. But what ends up happening is that we it's the tyranny of the urgent in our, in our business. We get so preoccupied and caught up working in the business that we don't work on the business and the on the business is the client contact in an ongoing way that just falls by the wayside because you get a home inspection at two o'clock you've got the deal that's not going to close that you wrote last week the landlord that you did the offer for the keys weren't in the lockbox it has just become so preoccupied and caught up with dealing with our current clients that we forget about the fact that there is business to be had with our past clients. Is that a fair, a fair statement? Um, it's a tyranny of the urgent guys. How much time, according to Gary Keller, should we be spending a week working on our business, not in our business? Does everyone understand the difference in versus on? So in is installing signs, putting up lock boxes, um, you know, showing houses, writing offers, all of those things. Working on your business is if you're uh, working by referral agent, is speaking to your clients, hosting, you know, events, seminars, inviting people to that kind of stuff. What's the ratio? How many hours a week should you be working on our business, not in our business? 80 percent. 15, 15 hours a week, so three hours a day. And who's like, I don't have three hours a day to work on my business? A lot of everybody does. Do you know how much time? I just who has an iPhone? Pull up your iPhone, tell me what your average screen time was per, per day. No, no, legit. Show me. Show me. Yeah. It's like five and a half hours sometimes, yeah. guys. This is like, this is a bag. This is a time suck. And we were like, I don't have time. I don't have time. I'm following the 15 of my clients today. But I had time to like watch something about John Body on Netflix yesterday. Like, that's the reality of what we're facing with. You said that hand raised. Oh, Tasha, what's your question? <clears throat> I didn't. Sorry, I didn't mean to raise, to raise my uh, my apologies. So we talked a little bit about conversion ratios, and this is really important because in this market, especially, um, we will be led astray if we just follow our emotions. So who feels like they've got a really great handle on their business right now? They're doing deals, or getting stuff done. They feel confident about where their next fifty deals are coming from. Who feels confident on that? Nobody does. I, you just keep doing your work. It will. You'll get to love it. See, you'll be on board. So that is the reality. So when you know, when there is a set um, end place, you know, so a person gets a job, you get your first job out of high school, they're like, okay, congratulations, you're hired. I need you here uh, tomorrow, Saturday, between nine o'clock, and you're going to work until five. And you know, if you work between nine o'clock and five o'clock, then at the end of the day or the end of the two week collection of days, you're going to get a paycheck. In real estate, it doesn't work the same way unless you wanted to. So I want to talk about conversion ratios here. So for new agents or agents who haven't worked their database, your average contact ratio is going to be 60 to 1 and then 3 to 1. So what that means is that you are going to have to reach out to your clients 60 times to generate one referral, and three referrals will generate a closed transaction. Now, I'm going to put the people on my group on the spot. What are your numbers right now as of this moment? 39 to 1. So Emily's 39 to 1 contact to referral and 6 or 7 to, six or seven to one. 1 for referrals to close. Does everybody know what that means? So for every 39 phone calls, text messages, video messages, emails that Emily sends, Emily is going to generate a referral to a will generate a referral from her database. And for every six of those referrals, that's going to generate a closed transaction. So um, you will know that what's 39 times six? Quick math. And we, we track this on our group every single week. Mm -hmm. So everybody knows exactly what their number is. So 234. So right now, Emily's at 234 contacts to close transaction. If I told anybody in this room that they were to go out and make 234 contacts with people who they already know, probably have already worked with them, um, or people mm -hmm. that, um, that they like, and 234 of those contacts, which includes video text messages, emails, phone calls, inviting them to an event at the office, 234 would result in a commission check 
which on average in the GTA is going to be somewhere around $18,000. Who would go out and make 234 calls this week to cash an $18,000 check at the end of this week? Who would do it? Everybody would. The reality is, is that everybody has a number. Everybody has a number. What's your number, Gabriel? Oh, I won't ask you because you're a new agent. It's for but it's one fifty eight. One fifty eight. Matt, what's your number? Um, it's forty nine to one and three to one. So. Forty nine to one and three to one. So Matt, just over one hundred and fifty contacts, and Matt's cash in commission check, close transaction. How long have you been selling real estate, Matt? Uh, fourteen months. How many close transactions this year? Uh, thirty four. Yeah. Did you, Matt, just so for context, did you like inherit a giant book of business from somebody that was leaving the industry? Do you have a lot of rich friends that all went to like St. Michael's College or something that are all buying? Only one. Only, only <laughs> one. And, and he has not. There you go. It is. This is a. Um, this is a formula that is repeatable for everybody. So right now, if you haven't been doing anything, you're averaging probably somewhere around 180 contacts to a closed transaction. So who wants to sell? Is anybody here sold? Just have a question. Yes, please. Those 60 contacts are you assuming these are in the B group? I don't really mark you don't see so I'm going to say it's A pluses okay. A's and B's. Okay. So it's people who there's some level of familiarity okay. with C's, your numbers would grow yeah, up exponentially. But it's more it's similar to like a door knocker or a cold caller where you're essentially marketing to strangers, which is why you want to build that relationship. Now you can take a whole bunch of C's and mark to them long no, enough that they become B's. B's. Oh yeah, no, we're just saying, but people like, yeah. I don't know anybody, like, which yeah. is probably factually not true, but, um, so who would, who's done 50 transactions this year? Who would like to do 50 transactions this year? <laughs> yeah. 50 transactions, if you're averaging 180 contacts per sale, that means 9,000 contacts per year. Assuming you have 350 relationships, um, it's 25 per year per relationship or approximately two and a half per month for the MAC people. Is that something that resonates with you guys? 9,000 contacts per year. So again, does that mean, but so you're like 9,000, I can't make 9,000 phone calls in a year. No, there's no human that can make 9,000 contacts. We're going to talk about how we vary our contacts with people. So calculating contact ratios. So if you want to sell 12 houses this year and you need 180 contacts per sale, you need 2,160 contacts per year. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Is that like simple basic math? So you say, I know you're an engineer. You're like, yes, that is factually correct. That makes sense. I want to talk a little bit about this because this is where belief and disbelief <coughs> starts to come in. So is anybody familiar with the principle of the law of the harvest? Do you guys talk about that during gold and all? No? The so borderline know. biblical principle comes from the Bible. In business, you hear the, this term all the time, law of the harvest. Does anyone know what that means? Oh, you do because we talked about it. So law of the harvest. So imagine that you're, we can get into that. We probably know it today, but law of the harvest a harvest essentially provides for the fact that if you are a farmer and you go out and you plant a number of seeds, you are going to reap a harvest or a crop from the seeds that you plant. If you are not planting any seeds in the spring, what is the likelihood something is going to grow in the fall? So if you have corn and you're a corn farmer and you do not plant any corn in the spring, how much corn are you going to be yielding in the fall? Zero. That's right. If you are a farmer and you go out and plant your seeds in um in whatever month i don't know what month corn is planted i apologize i'm not clearly on <laughs> um let's say that it's in you know april you plant your corn seeds in april and you go out the next day and you plant them on april 1st and april 3rd you go out and you're like no corn this isn't working this isn't working and then april 5th you're like still no corn clearly i knew that that girl mother <laughs> was like in that case june first rolls around still no corn there's not even anything coming out of the ground right and so you give up your efforts to feed the corn to water the corn to tend to the corn and then what ends up happening you end up with no crop so if you are a farmer you have to have a belief that the energy and effort that you put in is going to yield a crop at the end of the harvest. But it does require, at least in the first year, to suspend belief a little bit and have faith in the process. What ends up happening is that people are like, okay, 2,100 contacts a year. I can do 2,100 contacts a year. How many of this month? I can do that. And then they get two months in and they're like, this is hard. I just really <laughs> want to watch that thing on Netflix instead. And that ends up what happening. So people just stop tending to their gardens and then nothing will grow. Does anybody who's been through this process want to speak to what that feels like a little bit? I don't know, Matt, do you want to talk to that? Because it feels we've had this conversation. You're like, you're pounding away at your database. You're at six, seven, eight contacts with some of these people. You have not yet established, do I care? Do they care about 
So maybe you can explain it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just know that and it was a conversation that we had many times uh, as I kind of went through the first six, seven months where I, I felt like I wasn't getting anywhere. Um, and it, it also felt like because I was transitioning from a different uh, career that people weren't necessarily taking me fully seriously because they weren't sure if I was taking myself seriously. And it took 14 months and still I'm, I'm working away at it every day. Um, but now I can happily say that over half the transactions that I did this year came from referrals and it just snowballs and snowballs and, and it's kind of developing even more so. Um, so. So it requires you to have a belief in what it is that you're doing. And it's hard guys, because even for somebody like myself at the height of, uh, you know, at the height of our COVID market back in February, 2022, my conversion numbers were 18 contacts to one referral and two referrals to one closed transaction. And the ones that weren't closing were people because they didn't qualify or whatever. But you, I was nailing every 40 calls. I did 40 calls in the space of two hours and I'd end up with a $20,000 commission check. Um, right now, the reality is that everybody's conversion ratios are creeping up because there's just less transactions in the marketplace. And also because the agents who are sharks are out there building walls around their databases. So when you say 65 sounds a lot, guess what? If I can get my hands on one of your clients, that guy, I'm really excited to meet that guy who's you know, sent you 40 deals in the last year. If I can show up in service to him and I can get him into my database and he hears from me 65 times a year, is it likely that he may start to ask himself who provides better service? You've got a personal relationship, that's true. But am I doing a better job of showing up in service and showing my value as a real estate group? Maybe. So you need to be mindful of that, guys. Like you've got clients that you've worked with. You've got people who you think would be loyal to you till death do you part. And then they get snapped off by somebody like me who is out there hunting in this market for other people's clients who they do not have a fence around. It'll happen, guys. You have to be mindful of that. So let's talk. Okay, so conversion ratios. Any questions about conversion ratios? So under this, if you had 100 relationships, it's about 22 contacts per year per relationship. So not even anywhere close to what I'm doing, but 22. So let's talk about what your um, what what that looks like because you said 22 or 65. That sounds like a lot, and you're right. If we were just calling somebody 22 or 65 times or 35 times, that would be very overwhelming. But what does our database look like? So this is where we're relationship building, right? So we've got somebody in your database, maybe you've worked with them before, maybe they're an A, maybe they're an A plus, maybe they're a B, maybe they're a C, but we're gonna build a relationship. So we sit down as a real estate group, the 27 people that are on our, our team, and we build our marketing calendar at the very beginning of the year. So literally the first week back in January, we sit down and figure out how are we in community, how are we building community with these people? So off the top of my head, everybody, every two weeks they get an email, but emails are like, you might as well just, you know, roll up a bottle and throw it into the ocean. The chances are that your email gets deleted without even being read. High chance. So if you're only marketing via email, you're probably not doing much. We are doing six personal notes with our clients. So this is where you're actually sitting down and penning a personal note that is specific to them. So who's counting? So we've got um, 24 emails a year. 24, some give me a running total. 24 emails a year. We've got six personal notes. Four times a year, we met, we mail to our entire database, Design Lines Magazine, which we provide for all of our agents on the team, and includes a little update of the market. Here's what's going on, you know, something warm and buzzy talks about what our other events that we're doing as a real estate group. That's four times a year. Six times a year, we're doing uh, seminars for our clients to show up in service to our clients. So something not necessarily real estate related, but something, you know, kind of on the periphery of real estate. Not only are we doing six contacts around that, but there's usually three contacts. Please attend, you know, sorry you missed it. Hey, if you missed it, here's a recording. So there's three contacts, so 18 contacts around that. Twice a year, we do a huge client appreciation or um, uh, client appreciation program events. And what that means is that we invite everybody from our A pluses, A's, and many of our B's will come to one of two or both big events. So this year, we brought 1,600 people to the Blue Jays game. We had three sections of the Sky Dome, and they put us up on the Jumbotron. And how special do you think everybody felt? There were six contacts around invitations to the client appreciation event. We did a photo event um, two weekends ago at Miller Lash out in Scarborough. There were four contacts around that where people could come and have their family photos taken by a professional photographer. There's no cost for these events that we host for people. So there was four contacts around that. 
what else? Oh, holiday Popeyes. So we're going to talk about the season of giving, but this was our holiday Popeye last year. So for everybody that was in A and A plus and a selected B, got a Popeye where their agent went to their house and dropped something off. So, and knocked on their door and gave them a big hug and all those things. This is our last year. What were these candles? Candles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these are candles. This candle is this. Do you know? This is my candle. My beer. Beer. Matt, okay. These were our candles. We had personal little candles. They said Emily, McIntyre, Matt Trinier on them and people dropped them off. You gave your clients a hug, whatever. And you did a little, if they weren't home, you like left them a message on their ring doorbell camera or, you know, whatever. Um, who's, yeah. Oh, sorry. I just have a question. Like the candle, the Papa, is that like, a certain half of the year or is yes just so if you're going to start so i think holidays because our popeyes are usually down the first week of december it going to be a true statement guys that say that um your clients are right now in community with 150 people that you know are likely to be in community with 150 people that they know sometime in this next 60 45 day period mm -hmm. no and is it likely to say that somebody while getting together for you know Thanksgiving or Christmas is going to be having a conversation about real estate? Yeah. And would you not want to be top of mind at that moment when they're having a conversation with one of their cousins, relatives, next door neighbors, whatever? You want to be top of mind. So if you do nothing else, guys, get yourself some these are called Popeyes in our system. Get yourself some Popeyes. They don't have to be fancy, but you do need to show up and express gratitude to your database. We do this three times a year. We do um, a fall one. What did we do earlier? Honey? Something is. I did honey, honey in the stick. spring. We did honey in the spring. We're doing cutting boards this year. Let's say yes. something like it's good to be home or something. We're giving out 2,200 cutting boards to our collective databases. So super important. So when we talk about building community, um, not everything is going to land. Not every single person is going to attend every single seminar. Not everyone's coming to find appreciation. But we did a pumpkin Popeye where they could come and get like a free pumpkin at our office. That's called a reverse Popeye where you actually get them to come to you. We do video texts all the time. Just monthly market. We send a monthly market update video to everybody. So it is about establishing, I can trust you. You're good at what you do and you care about me. And if you're not doing that with your database, then you're not working my referral guys. Because when you do that, the referrals will come as long as you um, do it in a way that's not salesy. So I want to talk about what the ask sounds like. Well, you know, let's finish this. So we're building relationship with people before the transaction comes. Is that a fair statement? Any questions so far about this? Mm -hmm. Giving excellent service, pretty straightforward. So if you're going to do, um, let's do this real quick. Giving excellent service, that goes without saying. That's where you're they're showing up, they're engaging with your events, you're talking to them about the market. Is it fair to say that when somebody has a, a house that goes up for sale on their street, that they are would be curious to know what it might sell for? And if you call them before they can check it on House Sigma, there's a good chance that they would think of you, you know, kindly, like it would be showing up in service. So give excellent service, ask for referrals. I want to talk about what the asking of referral sounds like. So anybody who works by referral, what's your ask? What does it sound like? Because you don't want to be just the person who throws parties and talks about the market and all of that. People don't understand. So you all got real estate licenses at the beginning of this seminar. We talked about the disbelief that or the fundamental, you know, uh, incorrect belief that somehow deals would just come at you as a real estate agent. Many members of the public also don't realize that we work on a commission basis, that we only get compensated when we get a closed transaction, they just think, oh yeah, they're in real estate. Like they go to the office and then the office hands out leads. We need to explain to people how it is that we work, especially when we work by referral. So when you have to explain to somebody the fact that you work by referral, what does that sound like in a non-douchey sales way? JP, who's got, oh, JP, you got an ask for me? What's your ask? Hi, you know, we like to, hi, you know, me and my family like to help people in uh, with their real estate goals. Who do you know who would, uh, want to who would who would benefit from our service something like that maybe yeah are you comfortable saying that yeah i say it all the time but i'm just on on zoom right now so <laughs> <laughs> who else or, who else got an ask what does your ask sound like or um it's like you know working with you is so great like we love working with people like you do you know anyone who need have who have has real estate needs yeah so your ask doesn't have to have a question in it because this is where some people don't feel comfortable saying that and then they just don't go to the ask at all. What is, who's got an ask, doesn't have a question in it. Emily, what's your ask? We actually have them written on our desk at the office to remind us all the time. So. 
this to you or anyone you may know. Uh, yeah. 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 So if I ask as an example, so we're in, you know, we're in a relationship and Gabrielle is like, oh, Carol, thank you so much for all of your help. My, my ask comes in the form of response to a compliment in all cases, but always just as a following up end of a phone call conversation. So be like, oh, you know what? So great to catch up with you today. And just so you know, we're always here to provide service to anybody that you know with anything real estate related. It would be such an honor for my team and I to be able to serve you. That's an ask, guys. It doesn't put people on the spot to say like, who do you know? And they're like, uh, I don't know, my cousin. If I called you or communicated with you 65 times a year, and I asked you 65 times a year, who do you know? Who do you know? Who do you know? You come off as transactional. You come off as the only reason I was calling to ask who I can get something. Does everyone see the difference? It's a slight pivot, but when you take the question mark out of it and it's a statement about who you are as an agent, who you are as uh, as a real estate professional, it's a very, very different feel that you leave them with. Yeah. Say it again. Oh, well, you have to you have to find something that's organic to you. But for me, you're always going to hear service, honor, something about gratitude. It has been such a pleasure for my team and I to have been, and it sounds different every time because it's just so ingrained. It's been such a pleasure for my team and I, uh, team and I, to have been a service to you. If there's anything you know we can do to help you or somebody that you know of anything real estate related, um, it would be an honor. So sometimes I will put the ask, but it'll sound funny, and it'll be like, "Oh, you guys are so awesome! Like, who do you know that is exactly like you? I wish I could just like replicate you nine times over." And so you can make the ask sound sort of like funny and less personal. But I find if you put people on the spot with the ask, then it becomes transactional when really what you're trying to do is appeal to the relational nature um, of that interaction. Is that a fair statement? Mm -hmm. Any other questions about what the ask sounds like? Because that's really important. And everybody's ask is going to sound different. Everybody's ask is, what's your ask, Gabriella? If there's one or two people that you know that would need our services, please, you know, send them my way or give me their number and name number and I'll reach out to them and provide them with whatever they need. Perfect. So that has a component to it that I want to touch on. When um, you initiate, you don't want to just create advocates that are passing along your business cards. I'll get asked by clients, oh, give me a stack of your business cards. I might as well just take the business cards and like throw them to the pigeons. Um, that's not the way that you want to get referrals. You will want to explain to people, be like, oh, thank you. That First of all, thank, thank them for even thinking of you for a referral. Um, but let them know that the best way for you to connect with a referral is um, for them to actually do a soft introduction to your client. Be like, hey, if you wouldn't mind, just text me their phone number or shoot me an email or something with their contact information. And then just so I can give them mine so that when they're ready, they've got it saved somewhere so that they'll know how to get in touch with me. So that doesn't sound salesy. It doesn't yeah. sound awful. But when you initiate the contact, you are three times more likely to actually land that referral than them just giving out a phone number. Real estate agent cards, it's like you can paper your walls with them. They're everywhere, guys. Like giving out business cards is like tying it to a passenger pigeon and just sending it into the ocean, right? Like it or sending it out to the wild. There's so, a hand raise. There. Oh, hand raise. Okay, who is it? Mm -hmm. Two rows. Yeah, I just had a question about uh, the whole ask. Um, so if it's someone, let's say like, let's say you're a month in, you just got your license and you're going to your inner sphere and asking them um, or trying to get to that whole referral base with just your inner sphere that you haven't, you haven't closed a transaction with them yet, or it's someone that you pass on the street and keep in contact with for the first week. How would you like what? I don't do too much scripting, but what would you go, how would you go about saying like, Hey, um, you know, I want to add value to some of the people that you might know. So refer me. So have you shown up in service to those people yet? Because if you look back, look at our wheel that we've got shown on the screen right now. So you're asking for referrals only after you have built a relationship with them and you've given them excellent service. People will not refer you and they will not work with you until they have um they have met in their minds what three things again guys can i trust you can i trust you are do you care of what you do, do you care and care about do you care about me so i would say uh dimitro's good respect you don't have the right to ask for a referral until you or you're not going to be very successful um as a working by referral agent until you do the, done the things to show up in service to them so i would suggest to you that you take take it a step back and say how do i show up in service uh, into the people in my database to be able to give them good information. So what does that look like, showing up at service? Because I just talked about a whole bunch of things that, that we do, but what is, what's an example of something you can do to show up in service to somebody who's in your database right now? You could provide them with a monthly stat update on just what's been going on in the market. Um, sure. 
Yeah. You could wish them a happy birthday if it's their birthday, wish them a happy anniversary. All of those things. Um, like relationships. Yeah. So it, you don't, they don't have to have been past clients in order for you to have that relationship. You can build a relationship. How many, what's the average number that agents start out with in terms of contacts in their database when they're a brand new agent? So you come out of real estate school, how many past clients do you have? Zero. Yeah. 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 It's a question. People are like 18. I'm like, no, it's the idea is that you have no past clients. So you have to start with somewhere and you start, you have to start somewhere and you start at the very beginning and you just build. And I want to speak to the fact because people will have circumstances where you put people in your database and you communicate with them. And then sure enough, it's inevitable. They never refer you. They never work with you or even worse. They go to somebody else. People use this as like proof that working by referral doesn't work. The reality is, guys, is that not every seed that a farmer plants grows. Sometimes they're going to buy 25 seeds and only two of them are going to turn to a referral. Sometimes you're going to market to 10 people and only five of them are going to ever do business with you. Um, there are some seeds, just like the nature, there are some seeds um, that are nuts. So that's the reality. You can't look at the ones that didn't grow. You have to work look at the ones that do grow. And some take a lot longer. I've had people in my database sometimes two, three, four years where I get nothing from them. They don't return my calls. They don't unsubscribe, but they have no real interaction. They don't show up at the seminars. They don't do the thing. And then out of the clear blue sky, I'll get a call from somebody to be like, oh, I so gave your name. I was like, I didn't even know so-and-so knew, like, cared that I was alive. But it happens, guys. So I want to talk about that. I also want to talk about the opportunity to market. So building your 12 month marketing calendar. Again, there are so many things that you can do. Call people to update them. Hey, I just thought you'd like to know the house down the street sold for, you know, whatever. You can do printed newsletters. You can do magazines. You can do market analysis, reading cards, do a client appreciation party, seminars, personal notes. Um, so I like to say at the very least, you need to be four to six face to face or voice to voice contacts in-person thank yous to dropping by um who's familiar with the idea of the popeye so i'm going to talk about where the marshmallow chickens come from so these are peeps peeps we talked about being disgusting they cost about two dollars the note has a little thing that says have your peeps call my peeps i'm never too busy for your one girls at one time i would do they're actually very hard to get in canada now because they're an american thing but at one time um, i would send out about 350 packages uh, to these people uh to people in my database and i would get 20 25 referrals directly out of that people like tagging me and being like oh, it's so funny ha, ha, ha. it's whatever it's a joke guys it's a pun the point <laughs> is is that um you are converting small little touch points into real transactions by staying in touch with people and not everything just so you guys know not everything has to be information stats heavy you know deep analysis into the value of their home people don't want to hear that they also don't want just the fluffy they also don't just want the marshmallow chickens it's about finding that careful balance between the two and so when we sit down and build our marketing calendar at the end of the year we are speaking to all the different parts of our database different people, different stages and seasons of life, people with the pragmatics, the aesthetics, build your marketing calendar, sit down, figure out your touch points. So if you know that you want to sell 18 homes this year and you know that you're after 180 trans uh, contacts per closed transaction and you know how many contacts you need, you have to sit down and figure out, okay, in January, this is how I am going to show up to my database. In February, this is how I'm going to show up to my database. You have to sit down and plan because if you don't plan, there is no business there, guys. You just, we live through, you know, we live through chaos. Um, I just want to see what else we've got. So gratitude blitz, this is where you're acknowledging referral, where people often ask if I get a referral and they end up not going to me, do I still say thank you? Do I still reward the referrer? Yes, of course. You're still sending a thank you note. You're rewarding the action, not the outcome. Because if somebody refers you and you don't acknowledge that re that referral, they won't refer you again. Nobody wants to do something for the sake of, you know, of just being ignored about it. Um, when you call them and tell them how terrible of a client it was, like you, you don't, you don't want to do that. You want to acknowledge the referral in all cases. And then you're going to turn your, and then the final point was that you're going to turn your referral into an advocate. So that's where you do a business, you do business with somebody and then you turn them into an advocate. So as I said to you before, people will do a, a transaction every five to seven years on average. Some people stay in their homes 25 years, but how many times are they having conversations with other people about real estate? huge number hundreds of times a year probably everyone talks about real estate especially this year so systemize your contact um so you want to be 
you want to be um, systematized, so you want to know how many times. If you could, you should be able to pull up your um, your database and find out how many times you've been in touch with that uh, that client already this year. Because remember, how many times do you need to be in touch to establish that? 15 to 17. Yeah, and to stay top of mind, you need to you need to be at least 20 times a year and to stay top of mind. So don't be afraid to ask for uh, conversions. Improving contact ratios and lead conversions. Um, obviously, consistency is the most important thing. You plant a seed, you never water it, you never tend to it. The chances it's going to grow are going to are going to be very very low. So consistency of all of this is going to be the most important thing. You also we talked about initiating contact with the lead and saying thank you to the referral already. I want to talk a little bit about the marketing in general. Is this the end of it? I think it's the end. Oh, okay. I want to talk a little bit about the season that we're in right now because we talked about uh, conversion ratios going up right now, which is um, opposite of what normally happens. So usually when you pound away at a database, your conversion ratios will come down. I've been working my database for you know seven or eight years now. So um, so you know, I was at a place during the height of COVID where I was converting like 36 contacts to a to a closed transaction. The reality is, is even myself, somebody who is, you know, does this day in, day out, is at the top of my game, I'm seeing my contact to conversion go up right now. And so if that's what you're experiencing, I want you guys to know that is not unusual. What's happening is if you were here for, for Tackle Tuesdays, is that the transactions aren't closing right now. So you've got a whole bunch of referrals that have come in. Who's got a referral to a buyer or a seller client? And they're like, yeah, in the spring. Yeah, when the market changes. So those aren't, that's not a lack of conversion. Those are built up in your pipeline. So what that means is that the five that didn't close right now, like the five that didn't convert into a closed transaction, those are going to be pipeline transactions. And when the market does turn, and to be clear, guys, the market will turn. I know it feels like it's going to be, you know, a long, cold winter. And, and to be clear, it will be. But when the market turns, the pipeline, the stock is going to come out of those pipeline and transactions are going to pour out of it in record numbers. I believe that wholeheartedly. I could do a whole presentation just on the future of the Toronto real estate market. The reality is, is that we have a market right now that is has so much pent up demand in it. Um, that when the market does shift, we are probably going to see the most, what's the word I'm looking for? The most lucrative market for real estate agents that we have ever seen in the history of the Toronto Real Estate Board. I believe that. The reality is that we have huge demographic pressure coming in from immigration, both permanent residents arriving here, new Canadians, um, students that will become permanent residents. We have the demographic cohort of the children of the baby boomers starting to age up through the system now. We have investors that have been sat that have been sitting on the sidelines now for the better part of 18 months. And um, we have a whole group of buyers who are just sitting there and sellers who are just sitting there waiting for rates to come down so that they can jump back into the market. It is like a swimming pool where everyone is afraid to jump in because nobody knows mm -hmm. what the temperature of the water is. Once people start jumping in, it's going to be a free for all. And I will tell you that the agents that take this opportunity to build business systems that allow them to scale up are going to do very, very, very well in this new market. We're not going back to 2021 where you just stuck out your hand and deals rain from the sky. The reality is, and I see it firsthand, is that the mega teams, the groups of real estate agents, the individual agents that are building the systems are taking huge market share. Does anyone guess how much as a group we're up this year? Because I just found out. This time last year, we had closed 211 transactions. We just closed 314 this year in a market where 50% of the transactions are gone from last year. And so that is because there are so many people in our space right now who are just dropping the ball, who are leaving the industry, who are just saying, I'm not doing it, or they are afraid to get out in front of their clients because they're like, they're going to be upset at me because they paid $50,000 more than what their house is worth now. That is a fallacy, guys. You can't believe it. The reality is, is that there are sharks out there who are stealing your clients right now. You seem like you're doing a great job of staying in touch, but I promise you, me and Caitlin from our team was on the phone with a past client and somebody was door knocking her client while she was on the phone with them. There is desperation in the marketplace there right now, guys. This is the commissions have been spent. The deals have been done. We have had a terrible fall market. And the reality is, is that there are agents right now who are like holding on to staying in this industry by their fingernails and they will do whatever they can to make sure their kids get fed, the mortgages get paid, but they are working harder. We all have to just work harder. 
than we ever had before to convert our transactions. There's a saying I heard a few weeks ago, and I think it's really, really apt, guys. If you can get comfortable with one of two things, either planting in the spring or begging in the fall, let's infer that because we're in the fall, get prepared to plant in the fall or beg in the spring. Because right now we are in the middle of probably the greatest opportunity for database and business building that has ever existed in the Toronto real estate market. People are leaving the industry in droves. When the Trevor renewals come up on January 1st, we're going to see a huge amount of people leave again. Um, and all of their clients, all of their business is going to be left on the table up for grabs. Who's going to be the big pieces? I will be. Us. <laughs> Probably the people in this room because you cared enough, and the people online because you cared enough to show up today. And that's a big deal right now. Questions? I feel like I've gone in a whole bunch of information. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I don't know your name. Hi, Judy. Hi. Um, so all of the touches uh, when you're in January, you want to do what you're going to do. In terms of, you know, First agents just starting out cost wise, all of that stuff. How do you kind of deal with that in terms of how much money you're spending on everything, how much time you're spending on everything? Well, so money that we there should be a time of associated how much money you spend, but the reality is is that for lack of a better word, our time is free, right? Especially when we're not closing deals. So um so most of the things that we talk about don't actually cost a lot of money. It's touch points. It costs nothing to run a seminar. You can find a, you know, a partner that will run a seminar with you, um, and all you have to do is get your clients there, right? An online Zoom seminar. Um, you don't to cost nothing to call somebody and wish them a happy birthday. It costs nothing to do the check-in. The vast majority of our touch points um, cost nothing. Uh, I'll take a side step a little bit just to explain how our real estate group works because a lot of people hear the word team where I'm not a real estate team, I'm a real estate group. So I have 15 agents on my on my real estate group that are all running independent businesses under the umbrella of the services that we provide. So we have nine full-time administrators. You know, Emily has access to the same resources that um, that I do to grow my business. I invest in Emily's business by saying, okay, Emily, I think that you're going to do a really good job. I think that you're going to... Um, um, you're going to you know, follow your numbers. You're going to do the work that you need to do. So I'm prepared to partner with you and front all of your costs for everything that we talked about. You get to bring the to the game, all mail magazines to your database, all do all of that. So we act as a partnership with the agents um, in my real estate group to be able to fund them. Because I get it. It's a real conversation that people are having right now. I want to do this. This sounds great, but I don't have the resources to be able to pour into my business right now, or I don't have the time. So this is the, the big thing for, for us as a group. Um, and I know there's other people that are on teams or either on this call. Your agent should be doing nothing that is not working on their business or selling real estate. So if you are an agent who does your own deals, writes your own offers, you are, you know, mailing your own whatever. You are trying to uh, do all of the administrative functions. The reality is, is that doesn't scale. You can get to maybe 14 deals, maybe 14, 15 deals, maybe 20, 25, if you pour 60, 70 hours a week into it. But it doesn't scale in the long term. There are just no more hours in the day. You end up dropping the ball on the stuff that actually makes you more money and causes you to scale your business, which is your lead generation. That's what ends up happening. So um, I know that's a very long answer to a, a short to a short question, but I would say partner with a real estate group if you can find one that's willing to co-partner with you in terms of investment in your business. If you're willing to put in the be like, listen, I'm all in, I'm committed, I I want to be successful in this next season of my career. Find a team or a group that partner with you on that, or be really um, careful when playing red light green light with your expenses. So do everything you can do that's free to start. And then start putting in the stuff that costs a little bit more. Is that kind of answer? Yeah. People here are like, oh, Blue Jays game, twenty-five thousand dollars in tickets. Yeah, I get that, but um, you don't need to go to that extreme. But you know, could you go and buy you know two-dollar marshmallow chickens and put a you know funny tag on it, and then just go and show up and see your people? Yeah, you could. Something is better than nothing, right? But I would say red light, green light. Wait and see where it all where it all comes through. But fast majority stuff costs nothing at all. Is there questions online? Yeah. JB, what's your question? Sorry, just unmuting. So just real quick, I'll make this as fast as possible. So what are the examples of the six personal notes that you send a year? Um, so a, a, a bunch of different things. Um, if I 
Um, so we start the year with a gratitude notelet. So we say thank you to everybody in our databases for either working with us in the past, whether it was this year, last year, five years ago, just showing up in gratitude uh, to them. And then it will often be follow up notes to other interactions that we've had. So we get on a, you know, I, I call them just to check in. I find out their grandma died. It's going to be a really quick personal to be like, I'm so sorry for your loss. As an example, we're not talking about real estate guys, to be clear on sympathy notes. That's a, you should not be like bailing them here. Like, does grandma have a house? That's not a question. You might have to. Um, but no, it's so follow up to personal conversation. Sometimes I'll take an online relationship and try and take it offline. So I'll see that somebody's, I don't know, kid graduated from high school and I'll be like, wow, you must be so proud. You know, it's, it's a way to build a personal connection. When we talked at the beginning about farm areas and people who um, spend thousands of dollars to put stuff in people's mailboxes that all ends up in the garbage, um, or even worse, you know, the brokerage ends up getting angry calls about, you know, how we're killing the environment and stuff by flyering, by flyering neighborhoods. Um, the chances that a personal hand addressed note doesn't get opened by the recipient is 0%. If you get a personal handwritten note in the mail, you're opening it. So all kinds of different things without going too far down that at all. Reinforcing the personal nature of our relationship. Sometimes it will be a personal to be like, oh, thank you so much for attending, you know, a Wilson Estate Seminar. I'm always here to help. If you have any questions, you just let me know. That would be appropriate to put an ask in or your business card. So that sort of thing. Perfect. So what about a small personal touch point for a VIP client? Uh, I'm a smaller uh, team, so like maybe a, just something to drop by uh, seasonal wise. Uh, I don't know for Christmas. What what's something? Just a small example, a quick one. Yeah, I'll give you a great example. So my very first year, so I had been in real estate for a long, long time, um, and I was I would say I was like a chaos agent. You know, I was doing a high level of business, about three fifty, four hundred thousand dollars a year, but I was dying. Like I was. 60 70 hours a week running around open housing evening showings but just unsustainable and when i was eight months pregnant i went to a seminar and they were talking about the value of popeyes or just getting out in front of your clients it was the first week of december i was eight months pregnant and i was like well this makes sense the idea that if you show up you know to the people who have been the biggest supporters of your business um you know, to their houses at this time of year and just say thank you, not even like, where's my referrals? Just like, hey, thanks for your support. Um, I think that um, it would make sense that you would have good results. So I had a client at that time who was like a home baker, like she made cupcakes. So I reached out to her, I was like, hey, can you make me 25 boxes of cupcakes? And she delivered them and I like gift wrapped, like I just wrapped them with cellophane or whatever. And I brought them home and they were on my dining room table. My husband's like, are you high? Like you're eight months pregnant, you're gonna drive around like all over the city and deliver cupcakes. And I was like, I don't know, I was at the seminar and they were like, apparently if you go and you be grateful to your clients, they will, you know, return referrals to you. And apparently in one of these boxes, there's a $25,000 commission check. And I turned this, heard the story, told the story so many times. I could, a year later, I could directly trace back $225,000 in commissions that year, directly to referrals that came from the people that I had dropped off the cupcakes to. So it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be expensive. You don't need to go and buy like a $150 gift basket. It just needs to be heartfelt. They need to see you face to face and um, you need to show up in gratitude to them. I love so it. Thank you so much. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. What's a, what's a small like text? I do videos as well for text. What's a text video? Give me an example. Uh, text video. You get, we just sent out 10,000. Yeah. Um, we did, uh, like we're doing a an ongoing um, giveaway for handyman services. So we sent a video in, inviting everyone to register for that. Yeah. So it was a bit of a, so if you have your database, of it, I'll explain what we did. So we did a client appreciation event a few weeks ago. Um, obviously, the vast majority of people can't attend because it's not the right time or they're not interested or whatever. But I really don't care how many people come to the event. It's about the communication that I have around the event. And so we took everybody, the 3,000 people that didn't show up, and we sent them a link to register for free handyman services. And in order to register for it, they had to complete full contact information. So, for example, some people in our database, we had, you know, email addresses, home addresses, cell phones, um, but or we were missing one part of that. And so we required them to fully populate the Google the Google link in order to register. And man, people just coughed up all their personal information. If I was a hacker from China, I'd be like accessing all of their like bank accounts right now. Um, so. 
that was an example. Like we just texted the link a quick video to be like, hey, I'm so sorry we missed you with the event. Hopefully you can come next year. In the meantime, didn't want you to miss out on this chance to win handyman services. And uh, here's the link to register. And we got a tremendous response to that. I 300 registrations for that. So. So for somebody like us right now, probably we could just maybe say like our take on the interest rate or something like that. So maybe I, you could, but do people care that much? I don't know. I get more excited about free handyman services and I do about the interest rate. But, yeah. you know, I just don't I, I don't have a handyman uh, a thing right now. That's why I'm just trying well, to one in the it doesn't work. Say, um, we gave away a Super Bowl prize pack and it was like two cases of beer and a $50 pizza gift certificate. And we had like. 400 people sign up for that. It doesn't need to be extravagant. So it's about it's about knowing your clients and peppering through a happy mix of, you know, the aesthetic, the fluffy stuff, and also the hard market data. Because if you're just the person that gives away pizza gift cards, that's also not going to serve you well. And you can't be only the market stats guy. So you have to, it's about doing that nice variation. I love the that. Super Bowl thing. Thank you so much. I'm totally going to do that. Thank you. Anybody else questions? I yeah. have a question. Um, for your referral, do you just give like written like thank you note mm -hmm. that thank you for the referral, or, or do you like add something smaller for them? Like I guess like, like an Uber Eats gift card okay. sometimes. If it was a if it was a, a repeat referral who sends tons of stuff, I might do a larger gift basket or something. But yeah, it's something nominal. Um, we could do a whole other presentation on the love languages and how people give and receive love. If you haven't read that book, you should read that. The five love languages. Um, some people like you can give them gifts and it, like me, if you give me a gift, I'm like, what am I going to do with this? Like, I don't need more stuff. Right. Um, but other people, Gabriella is a gift person. Gabriella loves gifts. Right. So if I give her something, even if it's like a small little token, she loves it and she feels loved. Right. So, um, it's about rewarding in a way that, you know, we think is going to land through that particular client. We could go down a whole rabbit hole of knowing your client's love languages, but I don't want to. I don't want to muddy the water on that. But yeah, you want something. Uh, question, Jose. Hi, Carol, how are you? Good, how are you? Fun as well. Thanks for sharing so much insight. My pleasure. Do you have a question, Jose? Or you just give I, me like, like hey, no, great. No, no. <laughs> I was trying to be polite before the question. Oh, thank I, you. I appreciate that. Pragmatic. I'm just like, go fast. Like, spin it out, Jose. Don't have all day. Okay. How do you budget? Like uh, you do all these events and, and you have this database that's uh, providing all these resources for you. Do you have a budget that you work with or how do you manage all these expenses that you're you're working with? Uh, yes, that's a great question. Um, your bit, and without going too high level, because our operating budget for our real estate group is a million and a half dollars a year. Most of you are not going to be, you know, worrying about that, you know, eight hundred thousand dollars in staff salaries. Most of you don't have to be concerned about that figure out what's working. And so if you've read the book um, Shift, which I don't see it here, but it's a Gary Keller book, um, he talks about red light, green light. And so don't spend more until you know what's working for you. But again, most of the stuff is free. Um, a lot of people will get hung up on the idea that there's money associated, so I can't spend that money. It's not, guys. All you have, it's the end, your time and energy and effort, and that's the biggest part of it. Um, the vast majority of the marketing for our real estate group is done by our back-end administrative services so that we can keep the salespeople just one-on-one -on -one with our clients doing deals and um, and uh, moving forward on actually writing transactions. So a lot of it is automated on the back end. Uh, but again, it doesn't have to be expensive. But yeah, I have we can get in full discussion about uh, you know P and L statements and budgeting and. Um, but I don't think my answer would be relevant to a lot of people here because we're dealing with, you know. Is it, ever, is it ever a percentage of your annual income or whatever you did the year before? Um, no, it's not because I don't do advertising the same way. So, um, you know, my cost for touch, the, the vast majority is is very, very little. We do um, really strong cost analysis when I get asked to, like, sponsor. We recently sponsored the Variety Village Food Truck Festival. Um, we had some lead capture there, so I'd worked out backwards what those leads cost me, you know, to collect their information. But, um, no, I would say that the vast majority of the stuff that we talk about, the, the contact working by referral, is actually no cost. The only thing you're really absorbing costs on is your holiday Popeyes, if you choose to do the magazines, um, what because everybody's everybody's marketing calendar is going to look a little bit different. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's not a straight percentage. That's a short answer. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Anybody else have questions? 
All part of the personal fund as well. We're hiring guys. So <laughs> we're one of the few real estate groups that are um, looking for agents that are looking to partner to grow their business, um, either to start or restart their business or to I think it's 10x because it sounds so like awful, but we're really looking for people who are looking to go for like 20 deals a year to like 50 deals a year. And so if you're interested in having a conversation, I am happy to have a conversation uh, with anybody about that um, offline, about what your goals in real estate um, are about. We work, as I said, at our Kingston Road office. Um, come and have a visit and just see what we're all about. I think we're a fun group of people. It's 27 very highly, highly motivated people. Um, and then I did promise that the people who were here in person would get a something a little bit special. So if you're interested in having a one-hour coaching session with me to tell you, you know, what your marketing calendar might look like or answer your questions one-on-one, -on -one, leave a business card, and I'm happy we'll just draw them out of a Kind of a thing at the end. So, any other questions I can answer for anybody? Sorry, I just have one last question. Please. Your Popeyes is that your um, gift, like your Christmas gift for your clients? Yeah, we do three Popeyes a year. The the Christmas one is a little bit bigger, so they're I think it was they were eighteen dollars each this year. Plus, gift wrapping was twenty dollars, but they just they all they get them provided for their clients on the on the team. So we're on the real estate group. But yeah, that's my Christmas Popeye. We vary it every year. We used to do cupcakes, but then some people were like, I don't need gluten. Are these nut free? Like it got complicated. And then people were like, the smelly candles, I, are this soy based? I don't know. So this year we're doing cutting boards um, that are that are not branded, but they're like, they're because they're not real estate, but they're they're like nice, they're giftable. They came from a maker on Etsy. And um, and yeah, so but yeah, we try to vary it every year so it's not like the same the same. Oh, we didn't brownies one year yeah. but then the problem with anything edible is if you don't get them into people's hands within two days or three days it's like you can beat someone to death with a brownie with <laughs> so yeah. I have a question yeah um I'm just curious to know when you made a magazine or newsletter since you have different like, like different agent different areas you're yeah. serving do you customize are you customizing this uh, towards each agent's uh, let's say farming area or clientele no or it's just specific, no because the idea of working by referral you have to be very careful to not brand yourself as the east york agent because exactly. if you're outside of east so york it's just, it goes yeah no it's a it's very general analysis on the market that's okay. really what we're, we're looking at so here's okay. an example um yeah you know what what the you know we have examples here but the just the whole toronto whatever yeah, yeah the whole toronto it also talks about okay. the team if there's an ask in there what are we doing what events are coming up that sort of thing it's very soft okay. it's very soft it's not information heavy so okay. yeah oh thank you but yeah you have to be careful not to brand yourself yeah, as the you know scarborough specialist or then somebody who in a toco in an area that you sell will think of you as an out of area agent and not yeah. not you too yeah. yeah anything else no we're good oh wait jimmy's got one more question <laughs> Hi, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you so much again for everything. But just real quick, so what if you do have a, a like, how do you do a pop by somebody who's sort of you sold their house here, they moved uh, an hour away type of thing? It, it, you should just mail something out to them. Like, how do you do that? You get your car, you put the, their address in the GPS, and you go and see them. Now, you should match them because you don't want to go in like here, here, or here. What's the farthest you can drive for a pop by, Matt? Uh, yeah, okay. Hamilton, uh, yeah, Tottenham. Tottenham, yeah. yeah, you go and see them. Got it. Thank you. Oh, someone else has one? Maurice. Oh, you can unmute yourself. It sounds like a great question, Reese. There's lots of lots of words being asked. I just can't hear you. There you go. Oh, no. those still not. I think your microphone might not might, might not be on, Reese. Off again. No. Maurice, mm -hmm. ask your. Um, take the question. Take the question. Sean's going to tell us what the question is. I don't know how to get to the. I don't know the mouse. Yeah, I don't know how to get to the mouse. Maurice, I'm sorry. I can't hear you. Maurice, call me through the office and I'll call you back and answer your question privately. Any other questions? No. Thank you guys for coming. I know I'm off there. My pleasure. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. Thank you so much. There was so much pleasure. Anybody has a private question?